So good. Um, Again, just want to shout out to all the visitors and all the guests who are in the room today. Um, It's such an honor that we get to host you. Um, And really, I'm hoping that you have a good experience, meaning, um, you know, the coffee is good. Hope you enjoyed, um, you know, all that we have to offer. But the ultimate thing, my prayer and our prayer as the leadership team is that you meet Jesus today. Amen. We pray that as good as the coffee is, because it is good, I've heard, um, and as good as everything else is the kids program, but we want you to have an encounter with God. We want your kids, if you've brought kids, to have an encounter with God. Um, so wherever you are on the scale of whether you're like, I don't believe in Jesus, I'm an atheist, I don't believe he's real, on that side of the spectrum, all the way to I love Jesus and I'm just looking for a people to be a part of. Wherever you are on that journey, just know you're welcome in this place. Um, you don't have to believe what we believe. We, 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 we're going to encourage you to point you to who Jesus is, but you can believe what you want to believe and still come and still be a part of what God's doing here. And I believe if you stick around Jesus for long enough, you'll see him for who he truly is. And he is utterly amazing. He's worth giving everything in your life for. And if you meet him and you see him and you hear him say your name and you hear the Father whisper your voice and that you realize, hey, what he's done for you, it's, it's, uh, it's game over to unbelief and it's game over to anything else, amen? Because he's so, so good. So I hope that today you have an awesome Sunday. Um, cool. The other thing I want to mention is that today's a special day because like uh, Victoria said, um, we're launching the Yes Offering, um, which is our annual, uh, basically like a vision offering. Um, some people call it a miracle offering. We just call it a Yes Offering. Uh, it's a yearly offering that we commit to do as a church where we give our yes to God. Um, obviously, like you've maybe heard, uh, in Scripture, the Bible talks about honoring God with the first of your income and giving regularly, and, and that's amazing, and we do that as a church regularly. But this offering is a separate to that offering. This is above our tithe and our offering as a way to follow the biblical standard where it talks about how sometimes the, the Jews would give a portion to the storehouse for their tithe, but then they also would gather up money yearly to throw a party for all those homeless all those broken to do some justice in their society. They would also send money out of Jerusalem to go and send some money out beyond their borders. So what we do with this offering is that it's broken down in three ways. It's broken down for those around us, which is locally. So this year we'll be doing um, hampers again through the Hampered Initiative. Some is leading that team, coordinating that. So that's a great thing that you can get a part of, serve on it, build out these hampers. And at Christmas time, we go and lavish people or hamper people with the love of God. Amen. Through physical gifts. Um, food and all that kind of thing, which is great. And we do it through Anglicare. So we're looking to partner with them again. Um, and we're gonna, we want to bless more people than we did last year, amen. Um, I think, I can't remember exactly the number, but I think we did 60-odd. Some, if you're there, correct me if I'm wrong. But we did a number of hampers. Um, and this year, we want to be able to go more. We want to even double it. We want to bless as many people as we can, amen. Also, like I said, following how um, the biblical protocol for giving, it also means those beyond us. So we get the opportunity that we're a part of a church here, Um, that get to do great things overseas, um, and we're blessed that we don't have to just partner with some organization. It's even within our own organization, which is so cool. So through um, Freedom Ministries International, we're going to be partnering with them this year. It talks about this, by the way, all in this guide, but we're going to be partnering in two ways. One, we're going to be going um, with Freedom Ministries International to help Pastor Eric um, and partner with Luke 8, yeah, which has been fundraising this for a while. It's called Until They Have a Home. Yeah, and in the guide, you can see the, the plans that they want to build. We want to basically build a house uh, for Pastor Eric and all those people that, I guess, are suffering in a really vulnerable position um, in Kenya and in these slums. It's a very, um, what we say, volatile place to live. It's not safe at all. And anyone here who has children, imagine living in those circumstances where if you could give to something or be a part of something to build a house with a gate and security to protect people from all sorts of dreadful things like rape and and injustice, this is something worthy of our money, amen? It's worthy of our time. So um, 10% of what we're doing will go beyond us, 10% will go around us to that initiative. And also in the Beyond Us percentage, we're giving to Open Doors as well. And we love Open Doors. They give to the persecuted church, just like the faith that you and I have. Um, We come here freely. The worst thing you got was a red light on the way here. Um, But for one in seven Christians, they go to church or read their Bible with the risk of death, with the risk of being um, hurt, um, with the risk of being threatened just for their faith. It's not because they're bad people, they're great people, but one in seven Christians around the world suffer intense persecution and not just a thumbs down on Instagram, on a post you make about church and Jesus, that is not persecution. We're talking about real life persecution and threatening of their life. 
So we love to partner with them as well. So we send funds, and those funds are used to purchase um, rescue things. It's used to help restore church buildings. It's used to smuggle Bibles into countries. It's really an amazing thing that we get to do. So we love partnering with them, and this year we're going to be partnering with them too. Amen? And then the remainder of the money, 80%, is going to the future expansion of what the Lord wants to continue to do in our house. Um, we're going to have crusades this year, so we'll be allotting a lot of funds towards those. We really want to just make a dent in Melbourne City, amen, in the spirit. So we're talking to council and say, hey, where can we do this? Um, so this year, part of this offering will be going towards that, as well as other ways of continuing to upgrade this building and looking yonder as well as the Lord opens different doors to where he wants us to plan another location or what's going to happen next. We're kind of just, again, going off the map. We're following the cloud. Um, but this year, those funds are all going to be used for that. So make sure you take the guide home, read through it. Um, James has done a great work, um, our creative lead. Um, and I'll just read this out as a way just to show you the vision of it. Um, it's from Genesis 22. We're keeping in the theme of Abraham. Amen. And when God says to him, give me your son Isaac, so it's a powerful story, but it says, Welcome to this year's Yes Offering. In pondering the heart behind this opportunity to bring God an offering that goes beyond our regular giving, our minds are drawn to the story of Abraham and Isaac. In particular, the image of the torch held firmly in Abraham's hand and the knife tightly gripped in the other, as he scaled the mountain on which he would offer God his most precious possession. Today, these remain as symbols of both wholehearted trust in God and willingness to offer God everything he asked of Abraham. In like manner, may our firm hold on a readiness of heart and a willingness in spirit lead to a loosening of our grip on what God is bidding us to bring to him as an offering. And just as God's friends made his readiness known the moment God called, saying, Here I am, within us may this be our may there be found a yes for all that God asks from us, even before he has asked us. Amen. So what you can do, we want everybody just to pray. Um, again, if you're not regularly maybe have the opportunity yet, or you haven't started your journey of generosity with your normal income, um, start there. Um, give to what the Lord has instructed you to do with your normal giving. Um, but if you are doing that and then you're like, hey, I want to grow in generosity. I want to say yes to even what God wants to do. I would say pray. Yeah? Pray. Don't just give a figure because you want to give a figure. Ask God, what do you want me to give? How can I best serve you in this? And whatever he tells you, do your best to be obedient to that. Amen. Um, so we don't want any children. God asked Abraham for that. Please don't bring any kids here. You can keep your kids. What we're wanting um, is for you to just be obedient to what God reveals. Um, I have to get some laughing, you know. So we're talking about money, so people are staring at me. So it's like, hey, the, Jesus talked more about money than heaven and hell, so take it up with him. Um, but we, we want to make a difference. Amen. This offering um, is not to pr um, benefit anyone here. It's to benefit God's kingdom and benefit these people, like I've said. So pray then make your pledge. So there'll be this little card that you can take with you, what you're pledging. Talk as a family. Um, we sit down with our kids and say, hey, Isaiah, what can you give up? I, I, told, I totaled this that if one person gives up, I don't drink coffee, but my wife, I pay for her coffee. So a cheap coffee is like $5. Some of us might pay more. One coffee a week, so that's $5 a week, yeah? Of one person for each year, so it's 52 weeks. Um, it's $5 a week, it's $260, yeah? That's for one person. If one person gives out one coffee a week, someone's like, I've got no more money. So like, cool, give God a coffee this year. One, just one coffee a week. Some of us do three a day. And if you do one coffee a week that you say, I'm going to give those proceedings to this offering, it's 260 If 200 people give 260 that's 55000 and then if anyone goes above and beyond that, then we're definitely going to make a dent in these hampers. We'll make a dent in this house. We'll make a dent easily. So the question maybe isn't, I can't pray about it and then look at your coffee. Now, sorry to all the coffee drinkers. Maybe there's a protein shake out there that costs $5. You figure it out. But we all can sacrifice. If you can't make more, then just look at what you can take away and replace as the Lord leads you. Amen. So plenty to think about. We're believing this is going to be amazing. And on the back here, it says, yes, today, and, and an amen tomorrow. And that's what we're really believing, amen. We're saying yes to God today, and we're going to say amen to all that he wants to do through the church. Amen. So turn to someone and say, I say yes. I say yes. Awesome. Awesome. So knowing that uh, we will be launching this today, I think the Lord sort of influenced the word that he gave me. And I'm not going to talk long because um, I'm already aware of what the time is. So anyone who's like, oh my goodness, it's my lunch. It's okay. You're going to get to your lunch. Um, and we're going to move on with our day. But I guess just as a way to encourage you, the Lord reminded me of one of our declarations. Um, 
and one of our declarations, it's all about saying, a church, this is the church that we see. Um, this is the church that we see, or the church that we believe God's calling us to be. And one of them says, um, we want to be a church where we see generations join hands. Yeah, and it sounds like that's so poetic, and you've got younger people and older people skipping. And, but it's actually quite a powerful image. Yeah? We see a church where generations are holding hands and pursuing God and the things of God. Amen? Um, and that means every single one of you here are a part of this church, you matter, you're vital, and we want to come together and we want to be this covenant family that are pursuing to be a resting place for God. We want to be a, a committed community that are saying we want to make Jesus' name hallowed on the earth, treasured, um, adored. We want people in Melbourne to know that He's real, not to build a big church, but to build the kingdom of God. We want to be a people that join hands and we want people, in. The, doesn't matter how young you are or maybe how elderly you are or how mature you are or how wise you are, but we can join hands together and we can all encounter God ourselves and then give that encounter to someone else. Yeah, When a generation joins hands, it's like an army coming together. It's like a people who are, who are in a vicinity but locking arms. Yeah, I get the image of not just even joining hands but locking arms together with someone. can't really lock my arms myself. Um, I didn't think about that. But locking our arms. You get the picture, yeah? And we lock arms and we're strong now. Yeah, And you can't get through this because we're, we're, we've locked arms. We've decided to create like a wall for what we're doing. And God is saying, I'm wanting the generations to lock arms and hold hands so that nothing is going to get through and we're going to move with the kingdom of God. We're going to move and shine the light of God to our city, to our friends, to our, the people in our workplace. We're going to be representatives of God, ambassadors for Him. Amen? So this morning, um, I've titled this message from generation to generation. Um, and it's really just a word and I don't have much of a structure to what I'm going to say. I just feel the Lord burning in my heart. That he's, he's a God of generation to generation. He's a generational God. And if you have spent any time in the Bible, right from the get-go, we see that God is involved and interested in not just saving a person and individualizing their little relationship. Everything He does for one person, it's always got seeds for, to affect the rest of their generations, the rest of their family. Amen? Um, right in the beginning, we see Adam, and then God makes a covenant promise with Adam, and, and then we have Noah, and then we have Abraham, and in particular, these different people all walk with God, but then we see God making promises to them and their children's children. How many have you heard that God is a God of Abraham, the God of um, Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Yeah, you've heard that before. Well, basically, God is saying, I'm, I'm not just the God of you, Abraham, but I, I want to know you in such a way that it will affect your children, your children's children. And he even says to Abraham that all the families of the world, of the earth, will be blessed through you. It's powerful. And that thought, as much as we read it, it was like, wow, God loved Abraham. I'm here to tell you this morning that God wants to be a God of generations in your generation. God wants to be a generational God in your life. What He is doing right now in this moment in you, what He's doing to you, what He's doing through you, what He's been speaking to you about, it's not just for you. He does something in you so that he'll, it, will, it will change you, transform you, and then it wants you to release that to someone else. Be it your family but even be it the stranger, be it the person close to you. Don't hear me this morning and think, oh, he's talking about generations. I'm a single person. I don't have any children. Um, I haven't been able to do that. I don't want to remind you of what you're not. I want to hear call you that even if you don't have kids, you can still be a spiritual mother. You can still be a spiritual father. You are still called to be, have a relationship sorry, with a God who's a generational God. And He wants to use you to influence, to affect, and to change generations to come. Amen? Our time here on earth cannot just be for us. We need to be living beyond ourselves. We need to be thinking about, sometimes people call this legacy or they call it something else, but basically it's discipleship. It's thinking, this isn't just for me, this is also for others. In the Bible, I heard someone say, if you had to summarize the whole Bible in like a word, yeah, the whole Bible, and that's a hard feat to do, but this person, I liked it. He said, if you had to summarize the whole book, the whole story, basically the two words are, remember me. The whole story is God's just saying, remember me. Just remember me. Don't forget me. Remember me. And the whole Old Testament, the Israelites, they had this amazing relationship with, God of the, with, with Yahweh or with God of the Bible as you read it. And we see Him delivering them. We see the Red Sea parting. Amazing spiritual, miraculous encounters happen. And then what He says to them in Psalm 78, He says this in verse 1 to 8. 
We will not hide them from the descendants. He's talking about the things of God. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. He's talking about the Red Sea being parted, the plagues in Egypt, how God took a people who were slaves for 439 years and then He freed them and they became a free people. A miraculous thing happened. Verse 5, He decreed statutes for Jacob. And established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God. So why are we telling our children? So that their, our kids will place their own trust in God. That everyone will have their own encounter with God. Amen? As we pass on the story. Then he says, And would not forget his deeds, but would re- keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirit were not faithful to Him. The psalm continues to talk and he starts to speak. Don't be forgetful. Don't forget the Lord because God's people unfortunately forgot so much. But God was constantly saying, remember me. And they had festivals, statutes. Yeah, Remember me, remember me. And it all comes down to Jesus. And when Jesus is on the earth, He dies on the cross. He says, boys, I'm going to go. And what's he tell them to do? Remember me. God takes all the festivals that the Israelites used to do. And he says, now I'm going to give you, squeeze it into one thing that you must do this as often as you gather. Remember me. Remember what I've done for you. Remember me. Do not forget. Our ability to forget who God is, is tremendous. Our ability to forget what he's done It's actually remarkable. How many times have you faced, you've got a bill that comes in the mail or you've got some financial pressure and suddenly it's almost like you react and respond as if God has never come through all the other times He has. Or you get a diagnosis and you're like, oh, wow. And before you activate that faith, we pause for a second and fear comes. It's almost like we forget that we've been healed from this. We've seen that being um, set apart. We've seen that being transformed. We've seen all sorts of miracles, but we forget. We have uh, We have. The ability to forget quite easily, and that's why as humans we need to remember. And having all these festivals and statutes or communion even once a week or throughout your week is there to remind you of who God is, to lift your gaze and say, hey, I'm serving a God who's bigger than me, a God who's going to be here after I'm gone and a God who's calling me to live for the sake of others. Are you with me? Our God is a generational God and how we outwork this is through remembering Him. Um, In Exodus chapter 3 verse 15 This is Moses and God. So we're going back in the story. If you're new to the Bible, Moses is, you've probably heard his name, I'm sure. Um, But Moses is a character who basically in the first part of the Bible, he is as significant as Jesus is in the New Testament. He's the main guy, the most mentioned person in Scripture. Then it's David, then it's Jesus. So Moses is mentioned a lot and it's because he did a great thing for God. God said, I want to use you to set my people free. And in the verse that we're about to read, God has told him, you're going to go to Pharaoh, the ruler, the current um, uh, dictator that was harassing God's people. And you're going to tell that guy to let the people go and so they can worship me. And Moses is like, you got the wrong guy. I'm not the guy. I can't do that. How, what will I say? What if I say, say what you're saying and then they're going to question me? What will I tell them? And basically God says, hey, I'm not looking for your ability. He says, I'll be with you. So Relax. Then he says, God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. God is saying to Moses, when he is fearing what God is asking him to do, when he is unsure about his own ability, when he is doubting that he can do what God has commissioned him to do, God says, Remember that I'm the God of generations. And just like I was Moses' God, uh, sorry, Abraham's God, and Isaac's God, and Jacob's God, and that has got you to where you are right now. I'm the same God, the God of your fathers. So tell them who I am. Tell them it's the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of Isaac that's sending you. And this is meant to fuel Moses. This is meant to um, encourage him. This is meant to give him hope. And today it's almost like sometimes I believe God will some- say something to us He'll speak to us. He'll speak to you. And then we let the doubt that Moses had squash our revelation of who God is. We we allow the thoughts that come in our minds or the opinions of people or, or just secular society as a whole, how it's pressuring us or maybe influencing you. And we allow that to trump 
God's command on your life. We allow it to trump what God's saying to you. We allow it to trump what, who God's calling you to be because we are forgetting that our God is, is, is the God that He is. He's a, God, he's a generational God. He's been around a long time. He's going to be here when it's all over. And if He says something to you, you've got to trust Him. You've got to step out in it. We've got to say, hey, I'm going to join hands with people around me and we're going to, we're going to be a people who trust God and follow the cloud together. Amen? Amen. Turn to someone and say, he's, our God is a generational God. He's a God who wants us to understand how big and how vast He is so that we have the faith and the audacity to believe in what He said. Some of us need to believe in what He said over our own lives. Believe what He said over your finances. Maybe you're here and you're just struggling. Believe what He said over your identity. You are not what you've done. You have not a mistake. You're not the lies that you believe. You're not what that person has labeled you as or a doctor has labeled you as or a psychologist has labeled you as. You are what God has labeled you as. And what has He labeled you? He said you're holy and you're free and you're forgiven and you're worthy and you're loved and you're purposed and He has a plan for you. And when those voices come, you need to remind yourself that it's not just the God in my head. It's the God of Abraham and the God of Jacob and the God of Isaac and flip that around. That's the God who's speaking this over me. Are you with me? Yeah, we live in the New Testament. And, and if you're not, I guess, living in this book and reading the stories when you hear from God, but it's got no weight to it because you don't know who the God that's speaking to is. He's a big God. He created the universe. And when He speaks, He speaks to be obeyed. He speaks to be believed. He speaks to be, yeah, to follow through on. Um, so God is a God of generations. And I just sense Him wanting us to come together and to lay down our lives for something that's even bigger than ourselves. Yeah? I'm really sensing like when we go from, when, when generations join hands, it's like there's an unspoken thing in that statement that says, I'm no longer just living for me. I'm actually living for you and I'm living for you and we're doing this together. Because I don't want to see any generation get stuck behind. I don't want to see anyone get taken somewhere else where they're not meant to go. We're going to hold hands together and we're going to follow Jesus together because we actually need each other. We need the wisdom of, of the gray. And we need the youthfulness and the passion and the zeal of the young'uns and then everyone in between. Yeah? We need each other. We're a body and a body without a knee, a body without a hand, a body without a mouth isn't a true body. Yeah? Or it's, it's not what it's meant to be. And as a church, we need to be a place where generations join hands. So to help unpack this um, very briefly is, um, I'll get the image up. It's a butterfly. Um, maybe you've heard this before. I heard this last year. And it's like the Lord just reminding me of this story this week. Um, so these are called monarch butterflies. Very beautiful, aren't they? Um, if you go for orange. And um, essentially, these butterflies are special. Um, that's why there's a picture of them. I wouldn't be bringing them up if they weren't special. Um, as much as I love butterflies. I love butterflies. I've got like, nightmares of being in those butterfly houses as a kid. And they all land on you. Like, get off me. Get off me. Um, I normally, you know, we, I used to kill bugs as a kid, but in there, you've got to pretend like you, no one kills bugs. Everyone's like, oh, I love animals. At home, we all squat those things. But when you're there, it's like, oh, this is wonderful. If you're out in your house and all bugs land on you, I'm pretty sure no one acts the way they do in the greenhouse. I was just being genuine as a kid. And people are like, you can't do that. I'm like, well, whatever. Anyway, so this monarch butterfly is special for a few reasons. Um, they're found in Mexico, yeah? It's about 200 billion of them. Heaps ridiculous. And they grow and they grow and they grow. And what they do is that they leave Mexico and they head to Canada. Yeah, it's a long trip. And it takes them four generations to get there. It takes four generations of these butterflies to move. They leave all the rest of their family and they go on this journey and they'll fly until their prescribed distance is done. Then they lay some eggs and they die. Then those babies grow up they fly as far as they can go. Then they um, lay some eggs that, that comes out of a caterpillar. A caterpillar goes in the cocoon, turns into a butterfly, and then they go again. It takes four generations to span all the way to get to Mexico. Uh, sorry, from Mexico to Canada. And in Canada, they have their party. They do what they're meant to do there. Um, they reproduce and things. And then they take four generations to come back. And, and, and it's in their DNA, their design, that they know when they're born, we are born to go to another place. And they know that in my lifetime, I might not even get there. I'm going to spend my life journeying somewhere that I will not see myself, but the next generation will get there. And it's like, what the heck? And, and, you know, and God's designed these butterflies to have this inner assignment written on their hearts. 
And so if you're the first or the second or the third, you're not making it. <laughs> yeah? And even if you make it, then you're spending your life going back to see the rest of the, the family, see Pops and Gran. And there's four generations. They don't even know each other by the time they get there. But when I heard this and heard it explained, um, it, it reminded me of, I guess, what us as believers are called to do as well. We're meant to live with a bigger vision than just our own lives. We're meant to live with uh, a wide vision or a big gaze or a big understanding that, you know what, God has called us to do things as a church. He's called us to be things as, as followers of Jesus Christ. And some of the things are for yes and for now. They're for us to see. They're for us to go and take and to experience. But to see our city saved, to see Australia saved, to see heaven come to earth in the fullness that it's designed to be might be something that we might not even fully grasp or see in our own time. But we need to be willing to lay the groundwork. We need to be willing to be obedient. We need to be willing to live our lives not unto us, but unto Him. So that even if we don't get to see it, but we die in hope and faith, knowing that maybe the next generation, we're setting them up for a deeper encounter with God than we have. These butterflies don't live for themselves. They literally spend their life journeying to, to, to set up the next generation, to set up the next thing. And it just spoke to me and I felt the Lord saying that just like this monarch, it takes generations to complete what they were born for. What if every believer knew that there's things that we see and there's things that we are about, a bit out of our grasp that we're not meant to just give up on those things and say, well, I'm not going to see it in my lifetime. I'm not going to go for it. No, we're meant to still pray for those things, plan for those things, make the provisions for those things, knowing but someone else the generation that's coming next are going to be the ones who walk in the promises of what we've been holding on to. Are you with me? We've got to think bigger than ourselves. And when we say we want to be a church where there's generations holding hands, this is what I feel like the Lord is saying. We need to be like these monarch butterflies, that we want to give ourselves, give our lives to serving Jesus, to making His name known, to, to being obedient to Him, bigger than just ourselves or our experience bigger than just what we get to see and taste and achieve. We're willing to say, hey, I'm going to lay the groundwork for generations to come. Amen. For generations to come. Now, I'll talk about it a bit later, but I understand some of us, um, we might read the Bible, read the time and say, Jesus, come back. And I, of course he's coming back. Yeah, he's been, near, he's been, we've been in the last day for a long time. It's a long last day yeah, that he's going to return. But the idea is that, yeah, although he could come back at any moment, we want to have a heart that, we move and we're, we, the urgency we have is if he's coming back tomorrow. But we plan and we steward things as if he's not coming back for a long time. If we, if we plan and we, we steward things based on his coming back tomorrow, we're going to misuse things. We're not going to plan ahead. We're just going to give up. or not even setting up the next generation because all we're worried about is ourselves. He's coming back, so I'm just going to build my little life and make sure I'm ready and, and cross my fingers and just pray in my house. No. Jesus is saying, hey, you don't know when I'm coming back because if you knew... That would, that would not help us. That would convolute our motivation and our passion and our desire. He says, no one knows. Not even I know. The Father knows. But this is what you need to do. Be that servant who's found ready. Be the servant who's doing. Be the servant who's going. Be the person who is actively pursuing God's kingdom on the earth when I return. Are you with me? So we need to move with an urgency that he's coming back tomorrow. But we make plans and we steward what he's given us as if he's not coming back for a thousand years. Which means we're not, we're not setting up camp to go. We're saying, God, although heaven is my destiny, that's where you've called me to. But right now my assignment is to bring heaven to earth. Yeah, Too many Christians get caught up in that he's coming back soon and they put down their weapons and they try to just protect and survive not being tempted or not losing their salvation. We're not here to survive. We're here to thrive. We're actually put on earth to bring heaven to earth, not to plan to get out of earth. Are you with me? He will take us whenever He wants to take us. Pre, mid, post, yeah? Revelation and tribulation. Our job is not to plan to leave. Our job is to bring heaven to earth. And when He returns, He'll, have, he'll redeem the earth. And if the more we've redeemed, the less He has to. And, and the less work we do, the more He has to do. So I see it as we want to bring as much heaven to earth as we possibly can. And I am not going to to say, oh, I can't see that in my time, so I'm just going to give up on it. I want to pray that my children and your children, our children's children, if they're here, by God's grace, will be stepping into those things. Are you with me? Like these monarch butterflies, we are living beyond ourselves. Amen? It's not just for us. We, we might be pursuing some things that we will not actually see. We'll pray it into it. We'll set it up. But 
It's your children. It's your daughter. It's your, it's your son. It's that uncle. It's that niece. It's that whoever. That person at work, we're actually living yeah, beyond ourselves. We're living for other people. What if God's plans can't be accomplished by just one generation? Instead, it's to be a cooperative effort of multiple generations across multiple spans of time. Sometimes we live in this culture where it's all about me, my calling, what I'm going to do for God. That's too small of our thinking. If Abraham thought like that, then he would have given up on this whole seed for Isaac and then what would follow? If, if men of God that we read in the Bible, even in church history, only live for themselves, the gospel wouldn't even got to us. These people laid down their lives so that someone else, the next generation, the next person might have an encounter with Jesus Christ. We need to be a people who live beyond ourselves. Are you with me? This means one of our main responsibilities is to prepare the following generation through instruction, through example, through opportunity, with the responsibility to live in a spirit of revival every single day without any expectation. We need to build their faith that God can do anything, that nothing is impossible for those who believe. We need to um, teach them that sometimes, you know, or sorry, we need to believe ourselves that some of the greatest things that we will ever do for God might not be things we do, it might be people that we raise. Do you hear me, parents? What if the greatest thing in your life, when you get to heaven, the greatest thing that the Lord will say, well done, He'll say, well done because you raised them. It was never about what you were going to do. It was about who you would raise. And now with them, woof, we're going to take nations. Or we're going to even win two souls. We've got to stop thinking about outcome and numbers and we've just got to think about obedience. And as people, one day God will say, what did you do with I gave you? And He gave you children. He gave you a spouse. He gave you a husband. And he's going to say, what, did you cultivate them to be all they could be? Or did you make it all about your life and your calling and your mission and your ministry? And when we get to heaven, there are no ministries. There's the kingdom. So let's not build ministries. Let's build the kingdom. Let's be about the kingdom. Let's be about generations. Let's be about now and later, today and tomorrow. We need to pray and plan. And like David, I love him in the story of the Bible. He built a house for God without building a tool, without laying anything, but he paid for everything. He prepared the drawings because God said, you can't build it. So he's like, he didn't say, all right, stuff it then. Let's not even try. He said, I can't build it. He never said I can prepare it. So he spent millions of dollars preparing the temple that Solomon steps into it. And just, now we give Solomon the glory. He, Solomon's temple was called, really, it's David's temple. <laughs> it started in David's heart. He paid for it. He prepared it. Solomon gets the glory. And as he should, he's a pretty wise guy that sort of stuffed it up at the end. But why, what am I saying? I'm saying David pursued and built something that he knew he would never even be a part of. And God said, he has a heart after my own heart. Amen. Yes, he's a worshiper. And yes, but the fact that because he was a, such a worshiper, he's like, I will prepare a place for you that I will never even get to enjoy. I'm going to spend my life, the last best years of my life, all my money, all my time. I'm going to use my authority in the kingdom, not for, some, for me, but actually for the next generation. That's a leader. That's someone that I want to follow. That's, that's what I want to be a part of, a church that is like, hey, it's not even just about our church. It's about the church. And if we as a church can help join hands with a generation and say, we want to get everyone's eyes onto building God's kingdom. It doesn't matter if you're here with us or you're down the road or wherever you are, but we want to stir people to say, hey, Jesus is amazing. He is worth following. He's worth giving up everything in your life for. And let's join hands as a generation. Let's see this thing out. Let's run out our years and we're going to run out. We're going to grow old together and we're going to do it all pursuing Jesus the whole time. We're not going to have a bad, you know, you know we're going to disappear or no. We're committing to do this. I, I sense the Lord saying, I want to build something great and I want to do it through people who are all in for me. There's a story in the Bible of Hezekiah. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. Um, Old Testament, he was one of the greatest reformers in Scripture. Reformers means when God's people were going this way, disobedient, not listening, he would raise up these reformers, these kings. There's not many, there's a few. Although there's many horrible kings, but Hezekiah was a good one. And he got people killing, uh, killing, removing the idols, um, bringing back the word of God, showing honor to God again. And he's doing great and he's doing well. He gets sick, he prays and God says, I'll add 15 years to your life. So I was like, I don't know if he prayed for 15 or 14 or whatever. But he, he was so sick, he was going to die. He prays, he fasts and God says, I'll add 15 years to your life. And he's like, yes. Next thing we know in the story, in, um, it's in chapter 39, is that Babylon, which is an enemy, um, people who are going to, in the future, take them into exile, he invites them in. And they're like, they say, here's a gift, because we heard about your additional years. We heard that your God has saved you. So we just want to give you a gift. He says, 
hey, don't, you know what? Don't just give me a gift. Come in. Shows them, the, shows them the temple. Shows them all that they have. This is the enemy camp. He's like, look what we got. We got the gold. We got this. We got this. And Isaiah's a prophet. And he says, he gets word of it and says, Hezekiah, what did you do? And he's like, I just invited the Babylonians in. And there's nothing in the kingdom that I didn't show them. I showed them everything. And he's like boasting. He's like, I showed him everything, Isaiah. And Isaiah's like, you idiot. And he's like, and he prophesies. He says, because of what you've done, your children now will be slaves in Babylon. And your children will be eunuchs in Babylon. And your children are going to be suppressed and oppressed by these people because of what you've done. And you know what he says? This is what he says. Verse 5, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all your that all your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, your kids will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And here's the really juicy part. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah said. For he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Now, this is a great man of God that is not thinking multi-generational. He's thinking for him and himself. And he's like, I was going to die. I had 15 years added to me. I've made a mistake, but the consequences of my mistake won't affect me, just my kids. He says, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. How selfish. He's a king. He's a ruler of God's people. And he has done amazing things. And just because God uses a person doesn't mean everything they do and everything they think is right. We are still humans and we need to stay humble. And in this moment, he's not humble at all. He's thinking of himself and his own time. He's not worried about the next generation. And we can read this story and be like, oh, you know, that's great. What's it mean? Essentially, that means that in our lives, if we stop pursuing God, if we stop being obedient to God and we grow proud and we grow conceited or we grow idle and we stop pursuing doing what God's asked us to do, we get what happens when we're idle? We get bored is we start doing stuff. We start like David seeing Bathsheba when he should have been in at war. He was watching a girl having a bath. When Hezekiah should have been doing the things of God, he's showing the enemy, showing off what he's got. It led to his demise. And then it wasn't him, but the next generation that missed out. If we don't be aware of what God's doing even in our own hearts, if we get busy just counting what we've got, counting our blessings, all the things God's done, it's great, it's great, but we don't keep pursuing God for the next generation, we're actually going to set them up with failure. Some of our kids won't even serve the Lord anymore. If we don't serve God in such a way that's genuine and real, your children won't even want to go to church. They won't serve the Lord. And your children's children, so now your grandchildren, they will be atheists. And they'll talk of you. I had this weird, great, great guy. He used to go to Freedom Center. Bunch of weird guys. You will be a story and an embarrassment to their, to their like, testimony. If, if our God that we serve isn't real and it's not seen by our children, and we don't honor God, our kids won't want to walk with the Lord because the world's out there discipling them every day. So if we're not discipling them more intentionally, then good luck. Yeah. So again, I'm, not, I'm just sharing what I felt the Lord to share, but we need to pursue God in a genuine way, and this is almost like the warning part of it. We're invited to this great thing, but we're also warned. The cost of, of being a, gener- a hand-in-hand generational church, there's a cost to it. Time and commitment and love, and yes, it will cost... But the cost of not doing it is way higher than the cost of doing it. The cost of non-discipleship means your children won't serve the Lord. It means their eternity may be in hell. It means that you will, you will watch them just disappear and decay and you'll be able to do nothing. Because the times when you were meant to implant them with God's word, with reality, yeah, we missed it. We missed it. We missed it. Now is the time to serve the Lord, it says. Now is the time to seek Him. And now is the time to join hands and to be like these monarch butterflies. To say, hey, I'm going to live my life bigger than myself. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to live in such a way that I could have comfort and I could just have idleness and I could just, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. What you do in your moderation, your kids will just blow it up. Just a little bit of this, a little bit of drunkenness, a little bit of uh, idolatry, a little bit of immorality, a little bit of all the things of the world. Guess what? Your kids will watch and what you did in a little bit, they'll do in excess and then the devil's got them. Yeah, but we, it says, do not give a seat to Satan in Ephesians 5. Don't give him a place. Don't even open the door. 
You might be okay like Hezekiah. I'm good. I'm going to heaven. God loves me. What about your kids? Because you're not living just for you. We're living for the next generation. We need to have a mindset. If you don't feel convicted in your spirit, well, at least be convicted for the sake of the next generation. Sometimes I say no to things not for me. I'm a fine. I'm fine to, I don't, you know, do certain things. It's not because that thing's wrong. It's because I'm not even, I'm not, I'm doing, I'm not doing this for my children's sake or for your children's sake because I'm like, I want to be a person set apart for God and I want my kids to know that he serves the Lord. He hears from God and so can I. I don't want to convolute it. So if I have to choose between narrow or loose, I'm going with narrow, not as a law, but as a way to protect and safeguard my children. Are you with me? I'm following Jesus on the narrow way. And we want to be a multi-generational church. I've written here, King Hezekiah, who was great, was followed by his son Manasseh, who was one of the evilest kings in history. It went from Hezekiah, greatest king, to one of the worst kings. And it was all because of his choices, yeah? the choices he made. He didn't want to be a monarch butterfly. He disregarded his, his influence and said, I'm going to live for me. I'm going to live for now. I'm going to live for this moment. And we are in a culture that says, be true to yourself, YOLO, it's all about now. It's all about this moment. It's not about this moment. It's about the next moment and the next moment. It's about 20 years from now. It's about 50 years from now. It's about 100 years from now if the Lord remains away. We want to make decisions now that are setting up our generations to serve God, to know God. Yeah, We want to set our city up to know God. That means we've got to pray and pray and we're going to walk and we're going to crusade and we're going to take this. We might not see the city of Melbourne saved in the sense of the whole city, but we might see five people saved and those five people who get saved will then go and save the people that God's ordained for them to save. And in a hundred years, we're reading about how Melbourne has been saved because Melbourne will be saved because we are praying and we're hoping for that. It's just the timing. We don't get to choose the timing, but we're not going to just say, oh, it's not really happening. Let's just give up on it. Because what about the next generation? Yeah? Think of the monarch butterfly. Are you with me? So this is what the Lord's put in my heart. So I guess practically as I wrap this up, we need to stay hungry. Yeah? Hezekiah stopped being hungry. He got content. His appetite was full. The Bible says, "Seek those who seek and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Yeah? And it doesn't say that they'll stop seeking. It says that their hunger will be filled. And I believe as your hunger is filled, then your capacity to hunger more just grows. So it's like the more you hunger, the more you're filled. The more you're filled, the more you hunger. The more you're hungry, the more you're filled. And your capacity for God just grows. You get more hungry and more filled. It doesn't say the hunger, those who thirst and hunger for righteousness shall um, have their appetite quenched. It says that they'll be filled with what they want. And there's no lid on God. There's no capacity. There's no, oh, you've had enough of me now. No, He will keep pouring Himself out wherever He's hungered for, wherever He's welcome for. So we, therefore, need to stay hungry. If you're not hungry for God right now, it means you're sick in the Spirit. Yeah, my kids, when they don't eat, they always eat. My son always eats. And when he's not hungry, I'm like, what's wrong with you? You're not hungry. I'll be like, you want ice cream? That's the test. Do you want ice cream? And he's like, no. Nah. I'm like, Phew, this boy needs prayer. He's sick. He doesn't even want ice cream. If you're not hungry for God, then you're sick in the spirit. Something's wrong with you. And that's not a condemnation. It means just figure it out. Ask the Holy Spirit what's going on. And then he'll point on it. He'll highlight it and just fix it. Give it to him. Repent. Give it over to Him. It's the best thing for you. It's to give God the things that we're never designed to carry or be. Amen. Some of us might feel like we've made it. We feel content with where we're at. We've got family going on. We've got things happening. We've got the house and we've got the this. Don't be like Hezekiah, who in his blessing or in his um, surplus, he forgot God and started making choices. Open himself up for the enemy. Don't open ourselves up for the enemy. Yeah, some of us are under the lullaby of Satan. We're just being distracted, distracted, distracted. It's not that we're trying to forget God. It's that we're just not remembering Him. And guess what? The culture is going to make you forget. It's going to give you this and give you this. Think about this. Think about this. And then it's gone a week. You're not even, you haven't even been with Jesus. And you, you do that over time and months. You, your kids won't be following Jesus if you are not following Jesus now. Yeah? I believe... God gives us hunger because He wants us, to, there's something, there's more of Him to have, yeah? Think like this, if, if sweet, yeah? I, I, on the 21 day fast, I was craving sugar. Biggest thing, just like Krispy Kremes. Just I want sweet. Now, if Krispy Kremes were not real, I couldn't crave Krispy Kremes, true? If I'd never tasted one, it's hard to crave something you've never had. So the fact that I crave for more of God tells me there is more of God. 
Does that make sense? You cannot crave something that doesn't exist. So God gives us these holy cravings. He gives us a holy hunger because there is more to Him. And how do I know? Look at the life of Jesus. I'm not living the life of Jesus yet. That's what I'm pursuing. But when He walked the earth, signs and wonders, but even miraculous love, miraculous passion, miraculous kindness, like we heard from Bob, miraculous love was seen in His life. So the life of Jesus tells me there is more in God that I still need to step into. And then He even said, pray that heaven will come to earth. The second reason why there's, I know there's more, because He told us, boys, this isn't it. When you pray, start like this. Our Father that's in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He told us to pray that heaven will come to earth. He didn't say pray that you would be safe and you'd go to heaven. He said pray that heaven comes here, not that you'd go there. So our time shouldn't be consumed with trying to figure out when He's coming. Our time should be consumed with bringing heaven to earth before He comes. Are you with me? Heaven is our destiny. Bringing heaven is our, is our assignment. We don't want to mix up the two. So we want to stay hungry. We've got to remember that we're here for a time. So this is how I would say it. When you're reading your Bible, or maybe you've been forgetful, think of it now like this. When you read your Bible, you're not just reading for you. You're reading for your generations. You're reading for the guy at work who doesn't know God. Because when you get in the Word, God will give you a Word, and then you'll be able to share the Word. Maybe when you pray, I don't like praying. You're not just praying for you. You're praying for the next generation. If you have no urge to, to fast or to worship, or to do the things that is, forget about what, doing it just for you. You're doing it for the next generation. We need to pursue God, not for just us, but for the next generation. Are you with me? So this brings me motivation, even when I'm tired, even when I don't feel it, even when I make mistakes and I feel guilty. I haven't read enough. I haven't prayed enough. That's okay. But say, hey, I've got this little thing that I say to myself, Neil, it's not about you. It's about Him. It's not about you. It's about Him. Even when I feel guilty, I say, it's not about me. I'm not going to sit in guilt. It's about Him. Who cares? Shrug off the guilt and let's do the thing that God's asking me to do. Or maybe you're not feeling guilt. Maybe you're feeling idleness or selfishness. Hey, it's not about you. It's about Him. And it's about the next generation who need to know Him. Amen. I'm going to get you to stand to your feet as I finish to pray. There's no altar call today, but we're just going to start to pray. And I'm not even going to tell you what to say. But there's an opportunity, like I said, there's an invitation, like a double-sided coin. There's an invitation to be a church where we are, are, gener are generations that join hands. And on the other side of that coin is the warning of what it looks like if we don't join hands. We're going to have strong bits, strong pockets, but then weak spots and weak. And, and either we're going to have people miss out on who God's called them to be. And some people will walk in the fulfillment of their life. Some people won't. But I don't want to settle for that. I want to see everybody stepping into the God-given destiny. And if they don't want to, that's up to them. But they're going to have to, we're going to make it hard for them. <laughs> we're going to make it hard because we're going to call you who you are. We're going to speak over your godly identity. If you don't want it, you don't want it. That's fine. But it won't be because you weren't sure how to. It won't be because you didn't know what to do. Amen. So I'm just going to leave it open. Just start to pray. Just start to pray in your own language or start to pray in, in the spirit if you want. Just start to commit to God. Just say, if you want to, God, I want to be, I want to have a relationship with you that is bigger than myself. Just start to tell him that I don't want to live just for me. I want to live beyond myself. Maybe you're like Hezekiah this morning. There's been things that you've picked up, things that you've started, and you just, today the Holy Spirit's bringing conviction, saying, shut the door on that thing. Stop looking at that site. Stop spending on that thing. Stop gossiping. Stop doing that thing. Because God's saying, this is opening a doorway for your children. I encourage you to pray this with me. The Bible says that if we can confess with our mouth, and believe in our heart that He is Lord, that we shall be saved. And it gives us a moment in time where now the Holy Spirit can come and start to speak to us more. Amen. About who God is and what He's done. So I want to lead you in this prayer. And in this prayer, we're saying, Jesus, I believe you died for me. And therefore, you're worthy of my life. And I want to follow you. I want to know more about you. And I want to commit to yeah, make you the king of my heart. And I want to follow you. Amen. So if you would, love to, uh, if you would like to pray that prayer. We're going to say this all together. And then afterwards, I want you to go to our team and let them know about your decision. So we can give you a Bible. We can help you know what's the next thing to do. And we can really help you on the discipleship journey. Amen. Let's pray this as a family. Thank you, Lord. That you died for me. And you resurrected for me. To give me new life. You choose to forgive my sin. And give to me your righteousness so I can have peace with you and I can know you fully. Jesus, I commit to follow you. 
I believe you took my place so that now I can have yours. Holy Spirit, I want to know you. Father, I want to know you. And Jesus, I want to know you. I choose to believe and follow you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give those who said that prayer the first time or the second time a massive round of applause.